Good morning. My name is Randy. I'm the pastor here at East Vancouver Community Church, and I'd like to welcome you here to the service this morning. Thank you so much for those that are in-house, and thank you for those that are online. Uh, for those that like to have their Bibles ready, I'm going to be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning, 1 Peter chapter 1 to begin our service this morning. But if you are new with us this morning, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope and pray that you will find this church family, a church family in which you can grow in your relationship with Jesus and uh, to be known by him and to be known by us and that we might know you for we are striving to be a church family that is all in to focus on God, focus on people and focus on the body, which is the church. That's who we're striving to be. And so please, please consider joining us in our pursuit of Jesus Christ. By the way, Happy Memorial Day. Uh, we, will, uh, we will have more of that uh, a little bit later in the service. But I'd like to start off our service this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you have caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, in this we rejoice. This is why we're here, Lord, is to, to celebrate you, to worship you, to sing praises to you, to hear from your word and, and know how you want us to um, live our life for you. And Lord, you also want us to be encouraging one another and even more as the day draws nearer of your return. And so, Lord, I thank you for this day and this opportunity, and I thank you for Memorial Day and all that it means of those who have given their life for this country. But Jesus, thank you that you gave your life, and thank you that you rose from the dead, and all those who place their belief in you can too have new life and rise to a new life from the dead. We celebrate this today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we worship our Lord through music this morning?
Amen. You may be seated. We have a great thing that's happening uh, right now. Uh, we're going to receive a couple of people into church membership. And so could I ask uh, Brent and Kimberly to come forward, please? Brent and Kimberly Curtis, go ahead and step on the first step there. Feel free to take. Church family, uh, this is an exciting day. We have a couple of people uh, who uh, have... Um, asked to become members of our church family. So Brent and Kimberly Curtis, I'm excited with you and celebrate today that through the grace of God you have been brought to a knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord and have been made partaker of this great salvation. Furthermore, we rejoice that you are seeking membership into the church and more specifically this local church, uh, which is the organized body of believers in Christ. Acts 2.42 says, that the believers were continually devoting themselves to the body of Christ. Becoming a member of the church is an act of devoting yourself to a local body of believers. We trust that through this fellowship you may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord so as to discover and use your spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ and further God's kingdom. So I'm just going to ask you the six uh, questions for you to answer, uh, which was already, you know, questions that you've already been asked, um, but now you're going to answer them in front of the church family. And so uh, these are the vows for becoming a member. Uh, Number one is this. Do you believe the Bible to be the Word of God and that therein only is revealed the way of salvation? And do you take this Word to be your rule of faith and conduct? If so, answer together, I do. Number two, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and do you now confess Him? If so, answer individually, and and we'll start with you, Kimberly. I have received Him and do now confess Him. Wonderful. Yeah, that's okay. I have received Him and do now confess Him. Praise God. Praise God. Church family, there's an amazing thing happening before us. Uh, Brent has uh, confessed with his mouth that two weeks ago he was born again. And before that, uh, before that, uh, Kimberly has been born again. In this we rejoice, do we not? Let's just give the Lord a clap offering. Do you promise to renounce all ungodliness to follow Christ? to make diligent use of the means of grace and sincerely to seek the advancement of the kingdom of God? If so, answer individually, starting with you, Kimberly, yes, by the help of God. Will you faithfully endeavor to know your privilege and responsibility as a Christian and as a member of East Vancouver Community Church? Will you be loyal to the church and sustain it with your regular attendance and uphold it with your earnest prayer? If so, answer together, yes, I will do so. Will you contribute of your means to support of the church as the Lord prospers you? And will you render Christian service according to your ability and opportunity? If so, answer together, I will. And then finally, are you acquainted with the doctrines, spiritual, and moral values of the evangelical church? Are you in harmony with them, and will you adhere to them? If so, answer individually, I am and will do so by the help of God. Awesome. Church family, it's your turn. Members of East Vancouver Community Church, I commend to your love and care, these people, Brent and Kimberly Curtis, whom we have this day received into the fellowship of our church, will you, will you enter into a covenant with them and seek to live out Colossians 3, 12 through 14, which I'm about to read, as one with us in the Lord? And so here's the, here's the passage, and then I'll ask you to respond. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And church family, if, if you will enter into this covenant 
and seek to live this out as one with Brent and Kimberly, I'd like you all to answer all together, by the, by the grace of God, we will. By the grace of God, we will. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and I'm going to add one more thing to this, to, uh, to membership here going forward. Do we have a specific couple or two that will take it upon themselves to care and pray for Brent and Kimberly according to your ability and opportunity as that comes about? If so, would you stand? Praise God. Praise God. Um, John and Barb, and if there's anybody else that wants to do that specifically, um, I know, you know, I know I address the, the whole family, but I'm, I'm asking specific people now, um, will you, as you, as the Lord leads you to, care and pray for, um, John and Barb, would you come lay hands on Brent and Kimberly as we pray for them? Church family, would you agree with me in prayer? Father, I thank you. I thank you for this day. This day is a day of celebration and And we want to bring honor and glory to you, Lord. Father, I thank you for Brent and Kimberly and what you're doing in their life. Lord, I thank you for this church family that is is receiving them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we uh, commend uh, Brent and Kimberly to you and ask that you would continue to grow them and sustain them with your spirit and your word. Grow them in Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would give us the grace as a church family all together to work together in uh, harmony as we as we seek to please you with our lives and so lord thank you for brent and kimberly protect them guide them continue to grow them by your spirit and your word in jesus name we pray amen so in the name of the lord jesus christ we welcome you into the fellowship of east vancouver community church church family would you give another round of applause thank you, thank you. Okay, I think we have another song to sing. Church family, would you stand as we worship the Lord together? Uh, We're going to introduce a new song today called There is a Savior. Um, The theme of it is everything that has to do about Jesus. So I hope that the song speaks to you today. Savior, His name is Jesus. 
back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war and I try to grasp it all come to grips with it stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves I am stunned by the sheer numbers all those lives all those families serving their country I can't always comprehend it my heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One marine who answered the call to fight for freedom one airman who knew the cost and went anyway, one man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many, and the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Today we choose to remember those who have given their lives on behalf of our country, on behalf of our freedoms, on behalf of our faith here in the United States of America. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you or your family lost a uh, family member uh, in serving, would you stand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then if you, uh, if you, I know that this is a, a weekend to remember those who have fallen, but, you know, we can also remember those who have served and, um, and be thankful for those uh, that have served and, and, and didn't fall. Um, if you have served and are serving or have served um, this country in the armed forces, would you stand? Let's, uh, I think it would be appropriate to give a round of applause uh, to them. Thank you. You may be seated. We're entering into our time of prayer, and I would ask that we would thank the Lord for those who have given their lives for this country. I would ask that we thank the Lord for the freedoms that we have in this country. Yes, there's much turmoil in this country. And I believe it breaks the heart of God to see what is happening in this country. And yet, we are so thankful, so thankful for those who have given their life. And so during this time, would you please thank the Lord for them? 
And then, of course, of course, along with that, let's thank God for giving His life because it's His life that gives us eternal hope. There's so many things that we can be thankful for today and so many things that we can pray for. So as uh, Wendy and the team leads us in this song during prayer time, would you cry out to God um, and have a thankful heart? Let's seek Him together. Father, what a beautiful song that is. Just give me Jesus. Lord, it brings much clarity to what's important and who's important. Thank you for music that helps us focus on and, and, and make our hearts come alive, Lord God, with things that are important. Jesus, we want to confess today and, and acknowledge that you are the one who is important. You are king. You are king of the universe. Lord, I want you to be king of my life. Jesus, I want you to be king of me. And I trust that everybody in the sanctuary and watching online, Lord, that they would, that they would come to that place to say, yeah, yeah, I, I, maybe I don't always feel like it, but I'm going to confess today that I want Jesus to be king of my heart. I want Jesus to be king of my life. 
because he went to the cross for me and paid a price that I could not pay. Thank you, Jesus, that you shed your blood so that all those who believe in you and turn from their sin can be washed. All those who just come to you and bring their sin to you can be washed and cleansed of their sin and have new hope, new life in you, Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice that you gave. And Lord, I want to thank you for the sacrifices that were given on behalf of this country. Lord, we have a few that have lost family members in this congregation as they serve this country. Lord, thank you for their lives. Thank you for all the men and women who have served for the freedoms that we have in this country. Thank you for the that they've served for so that we could dare I say easily practice our faith in this country. Thank you for their lives. Oh God, you created each and every one of them. Thank you for them and thank you for their families. God, continue to minister to families who are this weekend, they're remembering, Lord, they're remembering those who have fallen. Lord, would you comfort them? Would you bind up their hearts and be near to them? Lord, thank you for the men and women who stood this morning and said, yep, I've served. I've served for this country. Lord, thank you for them. God, thank you for this country. I ask that you would bless this country. I ask that you would turn hearts and eyes back to you. Lord God, Father, I pray that you'd capture hearts. And Lord, would you start here at East Vancouver Community Church? Would you continue to grow us into the family of God that you want us to be? And let the overflow of that be life-giving in, in this community. Lord, we love you and we need you. And we commit ourselves to you once again today. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church family, thank you so much for entering into a time of prayer. Uh, man, what a great day. What a good time we're having together in the presence of the Lord. Amen. This morning, we're going to be in John chapter 5. Uh, we'll also be, in, if I'm going to read a, a, a section out of Exodus 31. <laughs> that won't be on the screen, so I'm just preparing you for that if, if, you, if you want to know that in advance. But John chapter 5, starting in verse 10, is going to be our main text for today. Let me just give you a couple of announcements before we jump in this morning. Um, first of all, this coming Wednesday... Uh, the first Wednesday of June, June 2nd at 6.30 here in the sanctuary, we're going to have our first discipleship and counseling training. It's going to be a once a month discipleship and counseling training. Uh, about a month ago, I put a challenge out to uh, retirees that if you want to make your uh, retirement more meaningful and purposeful than you ever thought that it could be, um, please, please uh, join in on this effort in being equipped to help people with God's Word, because we have real people with real problems, and God has real answers, and He wants to help. And He, you know what? Uh, he helps us, and oftentimes He sends us a person. Oftentimes He sends us a person that says, hey, I may not have all the answers, but could I walk beside you? Could I seek the Lord together with you? And let's look into God's Word together and see what God has in store for you. And so that's, that's, our, uh, that's what we're doing starting this Wednesday. I would encourage you, whether you're in retirement or not in retirement, please consider being here at 6.30 this Wednesday. This is going to be a wonderful once-a-month life-giving time of growing in God's Word together and being equipped to help people with God's Word. Uh, thank you so much who, uh, uh, for those who are giving to the Carpet Project. So far, we have around $7,400 for the Carpet Project. Thank you so much for those who are giving. We are, we're getting to that goal. We're getting to that goal. Um, of, uh, man, the goal is eleven dollars or $12,000. Yeah. Um, Twelve. Okay, thank you. No, 11. Okay, that was one, 11. The goal is $11,000 for the carpet project in the lobby. And so thank you so much for those who are giving to that. 
Um, and then we have, uh, man, so, uh, somebody approached me this week and said, uh, Pastor Randy, could we start a, uh, a summer youth mission project um, because I'd like to give $1,000 to that. And so he had to really twist my arm hard and say, well, I guess so. Um, I guess we can do that. Uh, he really wanted to give $1,000 to the, the youth uh, uh, mission. Um, they're going on a mission trip in July. And so if uh, I know that some of you have been contacted personally, so I'm not asking you to get double give here. All I'm saying is that uh, somebody in the congregation has started this uh, fund of $1,000. And if you'd like to give to that um, summer mission project, um, please feel free to do so. Along with that, this coming Saturday, June June 5th, it, the youth are having a car wash in the parking lot from 9.30 to 3.30. June 5th, 9.30 to 3.30, donations only. Donations only. So if your car is a little bit dirty and you'd like to give a few dollars to, to see our youth uh, wash your car, um, please stop by between 9.30 and 3.30 to, to um, have your car washed and then donate a few bucks for their mission trip. And that being said, also, I'd ask for your prayer for tonight for the youth as they are having an all-nighter uh, this evening. Um, please be praying for the youth, but please be praying for the chaperones, okay? Please be praying for those chaperones who aren't youth, and they're having to stay up all night. Um, all I can say is, na 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 <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Did I do that? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I... I <laughs> All-nighters do have a special place in my heart, uh, uh, being a former youth pastor, but uh, I'm glad that they're doing it, okay? I'm glad that they're doing it. I think that's all the announcements I have for today. Let's see here. Let's see. What a, what a wonderful-looking group of people. We have a few, a few extra um, few extra. Uh, younger ones among us uh, today. If you're a little bit younger and not normally in service with us, would you just give a, would you just give a, a wave? I see you out there. I see you. I see that wave. I see that wave. Do I see any waves out here? I see that wave. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. Tell me, those of you that are a little bit younger than normal, have you ever seen a 600-pound pig? Have you ever seen a 600 pound? No, I didn't think so. I, I was going to be shocked if anybody had. But could I just tell you about a 600 pound pig named Chervil? My wife, growing up, she, uh, her name's Rebecca, by the way. Her, her name's Rebecca. Her, growing up in high school, she had some farm animals, okay, as a part of a program that she was in school. And one of those farm animals was a pig that she named Chervil. And this pig just kept eating and eating and eating. Do you know what pigs like to do? They like to eat and they like to play in the mud. Well, this pig did that. This pig went, got to 600 pounds. 600 pounds. If you were to go onto their little farm, it was a 10-acre little farm, and you would just see this pig walking around like a, like a house dog. It just walks around. It'd go to the, next to the house, and it'd scratch itself on the house, and then just, just a mess on the side of the house. Well, this pig was pregnant and was going to have some babies. The first time this pig, Chervil, got pregnant and was going to have some babies, the mama got so, just, just didn't know what was happening. And you know what? When that mama had babies, she turned around. I hope this isn't too horrible for you, but she turned around and ate one of those babies. She devoured her own. In fact, not, not the first, but the first two little piggies. She devoured her own. And so after that, when they... When, uh, when the pig Chervil was going to have babies again, they had to put her in a crate so that when, the ba when she uh, birthed the, the babies that she couldn't turn around and, and get them, but that they would be safe. And so, and so Rebecca would take the babies and she'd take a bottle and she'd feed those little piggies so that they could grow big and strong. Today we're going to be in a passage of Scripture that talks about, that talks about that shows us, not talks about it, it shows us people devouring their own. People devouring their own. But before we read that scripture, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Sabbath. Because this passage is in the context of 
the Sabbath day. That's going to be the very first sentence that we read. Now it was the Sabbath. So let me just give you a little bit of uh, fuller understanding. Some of you are like, man, I know all about the Sabbath. Some of you are like, what's he talking about Sabbath? And, and, and everywhere in between. And so let me just l- l- raise some understanding of the Sabbath. Genesis 2-3 says this. So Genesis 2-3, chapter 1 and, and chapter 2, if you want to know how God created the world, go to Gen- Genesis 1 and, and 2. But in verse 3, it says that, so God blessed the seventh day. You see, God created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, He rested. And verse 3 says, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Holy uh, it's, is a big word, but it, uh, it simply means to be set apart. To be set apart. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. Sabbath means rest. It means to stop from labor or stop from work. The first time the word Sabbath is mentioned in Exodus chapter 16. You see in Genesis, the word Sabbath, you won't even find the word Sabbath. It's not mentioned until Exodus chapter 16. But I'd like to read a a short passage from Exodus chapter 31 to just give you some understanding of how important the Sabbath was to God, okay? Exodus chapter 31, starting in verse 12, says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Kids, have you ever heard Moses? You ever heard of Moses before? Yep, you have. Okay. The Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all. Wow. Wow. Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you or set you apart. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. There was some work. So God just just told His people, this is very important to me that you stop from your work on the Sabbath day. That you set it apart. But then there's, there was some work that God required of His priests, of His priests on the Sabbath day. Uh, Two male lambs uh, were to be burnt offerings, besides the regular burnt and drink offerings, along with freshly baked fine flour cakes. God required these works or these offerings on the Sabbath day from His priests. In doing this work, in doing this work, the priests were crossing the threshold of no work. Are you with me so far, church family? Are you with me so far? God said, stop doing your regular work. But He had told the priests, I want you to do these offerings, these male lamb offerings, along with the fine flour cake offerings, on the Sabbath. In doing this work, the priests were crossing the threshold of no work. If they were to hold to the letter of the law in no work on the Sabbath, they would to have had to not do the work that God had told them to do on the Sabbath. Mind blown. Okay. What one commentator says it this way. Jewish life in Jesus' day revolved around the Sabbath. Elaborate laws had been designed so that everyone knew exactly how to keep the Sabbath. Jewish religious teachers had prohibited certain types of activities because it was considered work. This led to Jesus needing to clarify why the Sabbath was created in the first place. So let me give you this final verse before we jump in. Mark 2, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You see, Jesus was confronting their way of life in this statement because they had get, gotten in such a routine, the Jews had, they had gotten in such a routine that they, in their minds, or at least in their actions, 
they were serving the Sabbath and acting as if they had been made for the Sabbath rather than the Sabbath being made for them. Well, with that understanding, I'd like to go to the Scripture because in our passage of Scripture this morning, we're going to see religious leaders refusing to get to know Jesus, but instead choosing to devour their own over the issue of Sabbath. So would you stand with me to read God's Word as I read for us John chapter 5, starting in verse 10. And in my Bible, it's actually, I'm going to read the very last sentence of verse 9, which is set apart um, from the, and starts a new paragraph, because it says this, Now that day was the Sabbath. Now that day was the Sabbath. What's happening? Jesus had just healed a man. He had just healed a man. And now it says, Now that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. And it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Father, thank you so much for your word. Holy Spirit of God, would you teach us? Would you lead us in your word this morning? Father, I I want people to hear your word and not mine. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just fine-tune our hearing by your Holy Spirit. Open up your hearts to help us receive what you want us to receive today so that we might grow as men and women and young men and women as followers of Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the first thing that I want to give to you this morning regarding getting to know Jesus is this. Don't allow the crowds to stop you. Don't allow the crowds to stop you. You see, in this passage of Scripture, we see a man who was healed. And when that man, when the Jews saw this man take up his bedroll and, and, and work, on the Sabbath because he took up his bedroll. You see, you weren't even supposed to do that type of work on the Sabbath according to the system. When the Jews saw them, all all they said to him is, why are you doing that? Why are you carrying your bedroll? Well, the man who healed me, he told me to. Well, who is the man who told you to do that? And he didn't know who Jesus was and neither did they they didn't, he didn't know who healed him. He didn't know who healed him. Look at verse 13. Don't allow the crowds to stop you. Verse 13 says this. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was who healed him. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Jesus had withdrawn. So can you kind of picture it? Can you kind of picture it? There's a disturbance. A man was healed. 38 years in his sickness. (laughs) 38 years. And you better believe many of these Jews have seen this man for a long time. How do I know that? Well, he's near the temple. He's near the temple. 38 years he's been in his sickness waiting to be healed, wanting to get down into that pool and be healed. So there's a disturbance. And then because of the healing, then there's commotion, you know. And then there's excitement because of the commotion. And then there's crowds, more crowds gathering. And then chaos. Do we see that anywhere you know, around us today? <laughs> kind of. It's kind of like we see that progression. Kind of a picture of our world today. But the crowds and the chaos are part of the why behind the man who was healed not knowing who healed him. There's a good reason why this man doesn't know who healed him. But I don't know that we can let him off the hook that easy. I mean, come on. 
38 years in your sickness? You would think he would burst through the crowds to ask, who are you? You know, I, you, you spoke healing to me, and I'm, I'm going to get to you to find out who you are. But he doesn't do that. Jesus, it says that he withdrew because there were crowds. Let me ask you a question. Have you been healed of anything in your life? Whether it be a physical healing, a mental healing, an emotional healing, relational? How about soul healing? Have you been healed of anything in your life? Many of us have. Many of us have. How did you respond to the one who healed you? How did you respond to the one who healed you? Let me give you three realities stopping Christians today from getting to know the one who heals. Just, just three quick realities. Number one is this, fear of what others will think. This is a real thing that stops Christians today from getting to know the one who healed them. Well, what's, what's my brother or sister going to think if I, start, you know, if I start going after Jesus, if I start talking about him and wanting to get to know him? What's my parents going to think? What's my boss or my coworker going to think if I start talking about Jesus or, or talking about what he's been doing in my life? What, what are they going to think? This is a very real thing that many of us go through. I've got, I went through this for many years. Fear of what others are going, are going to think of me if I start talking about Jesus or bring him up at all and, and what, you know, of being a Christian of just saying that I'm a Christian. Friends, this is something that's stopping Christians today from getting to know the one who heals. Another thing is anxiety from where your mind is fixed. Anxiety from where your mind is fixed. Friends, can I encourage you to, uh, if you're not already doing this, would you please consider limiting your intake of world news? Would you consider limiting your intake of news around the country? I'm not saying don't be in the know. That's not what I'm saying. No, be in the know. But, but how often are you reading your Bible? I, I ask that out of love and concern as your pastor. Did you know that getting to know Jesus is the only thing that's going to prepare you for the day when he shows up and you stand before God to be accountable to him? That's the only thing. It's not whether you know what's happening in the news, as, as important as that is. But the only thing that's going to help you be ready on that day is that you're getting to know the one who healed you. And so I would encourage you, where, where are you fixing your mind? Where are you fixing your mind? Uh, there's a scripture that I don't have it up on the board, and I wasn't planning on sharing it, but there's a scripture that says, Him whose mind is stayed on you, you keep in perfect peace. You see, there's a peace out there that God wants to give to you, and He'll give you that peace if you keep your mind set on Him. Unfortunately, um, we, w it's really easy to fall into keeping our, keeping our minds on, on news or, or, or screens, screens or, or to-do lists. There's so much to do. Instead of keeping our minds on Jesus and what He would have us to be doing, right now, which is hoping in Him. Oh, how, about, how about distractions in the world? Distractions are keeping Christians from getting to know the one who, and I know these are kind of all, you know, um, these can all be intermingled. The first TV commercial aired on July 1st, 1941. Who saw that commercial? <laughs> it was during a Brooklyn Dodgers and Philadelphia Phillies ball game, and you're like, okay, some of you are like, oh. It was for Belova watches, and it was 10 seconds long, okay? And apparently Belova watches is still in existence today, I, I, I saw from, from the internet. 
And so um, if I'm watching a show, I'm there to watch the show, okay? Uh, how about you? If you're watching a show, you're there to watch the show and not necessarily the commercials unless we're watching the Super Bowl, right? I mean, unless we're watching the Super Bowl, it was like, you know, I'm there to watch the commercials and, you know. Um, but those commercials, those commercials, they try to lure us away with flashy lights and enticing promises. Friends, whatever distraction is keeping you from getting to know Jesus, that is the commercial that's rerunning in your life that you just need to turn off. You just need to turn that commercial off and get to the main thing. Get to the main thing. Would you be willing to name the commercial running in your life right now? I'm not asking you to name it out loud. No, that's not what I'm asking of you. If you're taking notes or, or if you're not taking notes, would you name it in your heart? Would you just name it? What is the commercial running in your life right now that is keeping you from getting to want, know the one who heals? Would you just name it or write it down right now? For the Jews in that time, the commercial was the rules and regulations. They were focused on them. This was keeping them from allowing God's character to be formed in them. Their focus on religious systems caused them to devour their own instead of build up people around them. When we don't turn off the commercials in our life, we become those who devour our own. We do. We become those who devour our own when we don't turn off the commercials in our life. And, and, and at this time, I just want to give an advertisement. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. If you personally want to take steps in dealing with this in your own life or want to help others, please show up this Wednesday at 630. Okay, there's the advertisement. Okay, there we go. Not only do we need to get past the crowds, but we need to be willing to address the cause of our condition. Address the cause of our condition. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says this. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, okay, you know what, I, 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 I'm going to go back a few verses because I really want us to get a feel for what's, for, for what's happening here. Um, so the Jews saw this man carrying his bedroll, and verse 12, they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place. Verse 14, afterward Jesus found him. He found this man in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Jesus helped the man understand the cause of his, condi his condition. Sin no more. Without acknowledging the cause, along with acting on that knowledge by addressing it, he might suffer more than he had already suffered for 38 years. Why? Because something worse might happen to him, according to Jesus. According to Jesus' words. It seems very clear for this occasion, this occasion, this individual, at this time and place, that Jesus is making a connection between his personal sin and his sickness. Now, let me be quick to say that this does not mean, this does not mean that everybody's sickness and suffering is because of personal sin. Nope, it doesn't mean that. In this circumstance, it seems pretty clear that Jesus is making a correlation here of sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Sickness and suffering is a result of one or a combination of things. Let me just quickly give this to you. For one, number one, sickness and suffering is always a result of original sin. Always. It's always a result of original sin. What do I mean by original? Sin in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sickness and suffering is always a result of that. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And then 1 Corinthians 15.21-22 says, For as by a man came death. You see, sin that came into the world through Adam brought death. As by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 
Because of original sin, death, dying, disease, and destruction is in the world. Sickness is always a result of original sin being in the world. Okay, but then added to that, there are instances, there are instances that people are sick because of personal sin. Because of personal sin. D.A. Carson says, some instances of suffering are the direct results of specific sin. Uh, I know a man, I know a man who uh, tried to take his life. He tried to take his own life. He was not successful in that. Uh, he's still living today, but he's blind. He's suffering um, because, of trying, because of a personal sin. It was a personal sin of trying to take his life, and now he's blind for the rest of his life. This, that would be one example, one example of a personal sin um, that led to uh, sickness and suffering. Our choices have real consequences. Unfortunately, more and more people are wanting to place the blame of their consequences somewhere else. Sometimes it's not personal sin that someone is suffering from, but because of another sin. So this is the third, the, the third way or reason why we have sickness and suffering of others' sin. And this one, let's be honest, we really like to talk about. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We really do. We really like to talk about others' sin. I don't, we don't like to talk about our own sin, do we? It's like, man, that's not comfortable. Why would, why would I expose myself? Uh, we we kind of like to go back to blame it on Adam and Eve, you know, man, that dirty, rotten couple back then, you know. But we, man, we really like to talk about other people's sin today. You just listen to people's conversations, and it's like pointing fingers all over the place. Let me offer a video clip here that will illustrate for us what it looks like. Let's see. Take responsibility of my own life or blame you. Ding, ding, ding. Blame you. Hands down. I mean, that's what we love to do. Every time. Every, but let me give you a warning here. Okay, let me just give a warning. Every time we stand in judgment of someone else, the Scripture says you are condemning yourself. Romans 2.1 says this, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. There is a difference between acknowledging someone else's sin that has hurt you and standing in judgment of them. And standing in judgment of them. There's a guy, uh, another guy uh, that, I, that I know who struggles to forgive his mom. This guy lives in another state, and I mean, you know, he, he, he struggles to forgive his mom um, because of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, her, his mom, you know, drank while, while he was in the womb, and, and he believes that he's a, a victim of fetal alcohol syndrome, and, and he struggles to forgive her. Another sin, another sin. When you acknowledge the cause of your condition, which, you know, I, I encourage him to acknowledge the cause. Because God can help clarify how to get help from that condition. But it's also good to acknowledge the real reason and not stand in judgment of another person. We need to stop pointing the finger at others and point it right back on ourselves because there's no worse sinner in the world than me. Some of you are like, that's right, Randy, you just said it. No worse sinner in the world than you. I'm talking about all of us. So let's just do an exercise. Let's say this all together. There's no worse sinner in the world than me. Here we go. There's no worse sinner in the world than me. I heard, somebody say Randy. No. Uh, we shouldn't judge others in a condemning way, nor do we need to take a victim mentality. We don't need to take a victim mentality. Why? Romans 8, 35 and 37 says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Friends, there is an important reality for everyone in this room and watching online to acknowledge about your current condition, whether you have known sickness or not. The Bible says, for all have sinned. All 
have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we forget what an awful wretch we were before Jesus, we become like the Jews in this passage. Think about the healed man for me, uh, for, for a second. The healed man. He gets healed after 38 years. Woohoo! I'm healed! I'm healed! And I have no idea who the guy is who healed me. But I'm healed, yes, 38 years! And the scripture records that this man did not go seek out who Jesus was nor give him thanks. If we were to contrast that with a guy in chapter 9, we'd see a completely different reaction. But this man, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to dog on the man, but, the, but the, the fact is, he did not give credit where credit was due. How about the Jews for a second? By the way, the Greek word for this, the, this Jews, gives us an understanding that these were the Jewish leaders, okay? These were the Jewish leaders of the time. And they were like, hey, someone is breaking the law of God. Can you, can you see that guy? He's carrying his bedroll. How dare him carry his bedroll on the Sabbath? Now, these Jews would have known that he had been sick for 38 years. And they don't say, can you believe that guy is walking? Wow, I wonder what happened. No. He's carrying his bedroll. What is going on? Let's get him. <laughs> they didn't ask, who healed you? Or how did you get healed? They asked, who is it who told you to carry that bedroll? It's the Sabbath, and it's not lawful to do such things. Loved ones, I'm guilty of this. Others are guilty of this. But we need to stop looking past humanity. These Jews had stopped looking past humanity. They, 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 weren't, they weren't looking at the humanness. They weren't looking at the miracle. They were looking at laws and regulations. We need to stop complaining about people breaking laws. Pastor, are you saying it's okay for, to, for people to break laws? No, that's not what I'm saying. But we need to stop complaining about it. People who don't follow Jesus do those things. It makes sense. We need to pray for them that they would be healed. We need to stop complaining about governors who are legislating evil laws. It breaks my heart for the laws that are being put in legislation. But it's not going to help us to complain about it. Let's not stand in judgment of others. Let's pray for them and then do the right thing. We need to stop complaining about how these things are going to impact our existence. And instead, we need to do something about it. And what we need to do about it is pray and love others well. Church family, I know no greater way to reach a community than to love people really, really well. Pastor, you didn't say pray. <laughs> you, you got me. I know no other way to reach a community by praying, following Jesus, and loving others really, really well. So I ask you, church family, who do you want to reach? Who do you want to reach? Is there space in the pew next to you? Are you willing to love somebody really well that they might consider following after Jesus with you? By the way, they can follow after Jesus and not sit in that pew. You might just want to invite them over to, for dinner. You might want to invite them over to your backyard. You might want to have, go, go have coffee with them. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the very people that we complain about. And every time we complain and pass judgment on another, God says that we are condemning ourselves. So who are we? We're saved. We're healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's go tell somebody about it.
Think of Jesus' perspective. We thought of the healed man. We thought of the Jews. Think of Jesus' perspective. I've healed you. (laughs) I've been sent to do my Father's will by bringing glory to him. Please come to me. For it is only those who come and receive me that will get to the Father in heaven. Please get to know me. My work has everything to do with bringing the healing that you need. Oh, but, but is Jesus really saying that, Pastor? He withdrew from the crowd. Is Jesus really wanting him to get to know him? Absolutely. What does it say later? Jesus went and found him. Jesus went and found him. So he healed him. He withdrew from the crowd. And then he went and found him at another time and encouraged him, hey, sin no more. See, you are healed. See, you are healed. It's like, hello, you've been healed. That might tell you something about who I am. Sin no more so that nothing worse may happen to you. The more you address the cause of your condition, the more you will see your need for the one you should be telling others about. And this is what I'll close with. Consider what you are telling others about Jesus. Consider what you are telling others about Jesus. Look at verse 15 with me. Verse 15 says, The man went away. So Jesus just told him, See you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Then then verse 15, The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. It is very clear that this man is not going to tell the Jews, hey, you're going to want to know this guy. You're going to want to get to know him because he apparently is the Savior. He healed me. He's like, no, he's going to report. He's going to report, hey, you, you wanted to know who the guy is? Hey, it's this guy. He came and found me. He's the one who healed me. He's the one that told me to carry my bedroll on the Sabbath, that dirty dog. I don't know that we should be too harsh on the man for not knowing Jesus <laughs> after all that I've said. But verse 15 gives us an indication that the man was not greatly interested in knowing Jesus very intimately. For as soon as he found out who Jesus was, he went and told the Jews. As you consider what you are telling others about Jesus, I'd like to give you three things about Jesus based on this passage. Here they are. Jesus is more than a rule breaker. Jesus is more than a rule breaker. That's what the Jews were seeing him as. This guy's just a rule breaker. But guess what? Christians, guess what? He is also more than a rule keeper. I think some of you need to hear that today. Jesus is also more than a rule keeper. How about this? Jesus is more than someone claiming equality with God. Those who simply land on this conclusion that he's just someone claiming equality with God, and by the way, a lot of people land on this conclusion. Guess what? They become gods unto themselves. They interpret Jesus how they want to interpret Jesus. They interpret Jesus to say, oh, Jesus was just a liberal, or Jesus was against institutions, or Jesus was, hey, Jesus wasn't just someone claiming equality with God, but Jesus is equal with God. Jesus is equal with God. Look at verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. To kill him. They were seeking to kill him. He asked somebody, he healed somebody and said, pick up your bedroll, walk, go. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling his own father, making himself, make, even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Wendy and the team, would you come up, please? Friends, get to know the one who heals. Get to know the one who heals. Maybe, maybe that for you, this might, uh, maybe you would, the Lord would lead you to grow in your understanding of the Sabbath. You see, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for us. Man, he wants us to take a rest and let us be a refreshment to us. Maybe getting to know the one who heals for you is that you would get to know people rather than looking at the, th- the wrong things that they're doing, but getting to know that person. Maybe being willing to hear their story. Maybe caring about a person rather than standing in judgment of them. 
But friends, let's get to know the one who heals. Let's get to know him. Would you stand as we worship the Lord through th- this music? Would you, consider, would you consider the words of this song? Because I believe that the words of this song is deeply connected to getting to, to know the one who heals. Let's respond to him today. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's good That will bless you just a moment I'm going to say a closing blessing but I don't I want to take this moment because I by faith I believe that God is working in hearts today and so with eyes closed and heads bowed um, if you're here today and you just need to say Lord Lord please forgive me please forgive me for not getting to know you like I should I want to get to know you if you're here today and you just need to confess something to the Lord I'm not asking you to tell me what it is. I'm not asking you to tell anybody else what it is. I'm asking you to confess it to the Lord because he's here and he's listening to your heart. If that's you and you just want to acknowledge that, you know what? Would you just raise your hand? Would you say, that's me today? Praise God. Thank you, sir. Thank you, young miss. Thank you, young miss. Thank you, young sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Praise God. God's Spirit is working among us. Praise the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you're just, you know what, I don't know that I, Pastor, I don't know that there's a specific sin that I need to confess, but man, I want more of Him. I want more of Him. 
So I just want to acknowledge today that I'm going to be very intentional in getting to know Him because I want to know my Savior who's healed me. If that's you today, would you raise your hand? Just acknowledge that's me. Praise God. Praise God. Hands going up. Hands going up around the, around the sanctuary. Praise God. God, you are awesome, and we love you. We love you. For those that need to confess, just remember that the Scripture says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so you can leave a clean person today. So just confess it to the Lord and you can leave a clean person today. Jesus is for us. He came to save us. And He wants us to pursue after Him and get to know Him. And so we are going to be a church family that gets to know Him. Praise God. Praise God. Let me say a blessing over us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Church family, I love you. Happy, happy Memorial Day. Have a great rest of your weekend.